Thank you so much for joining me today on the Positive Leadership Podcast uh, and all of our listeners. It's a pleasure, it's a delight, and I'd like to go back uh, to the beginning of your journey. Uh, you were born in Connecticut in the late 70s, and you spent your early childhood moving from place to place between Ghana to the U.S. and Kenya, <laughs> before finally yes. settling in Colorado Springs when, when you were, I think, 12. So how did that experience of being the perpetual new kid in the block or new kid in school <laughs> shape you <laughs> as a person to start with? <laughs> Ah, well, um, you know, it's funny. It's not until later on in my life when um, a great poet, some would just call him a hip-hop artist, but I call him a poet, Jay-Z, mm. uh, has a line in a song that says, allow me to reintroduce myself. Mm. That, that yes. is um, the essence of my childhood, you know? I think that that song came probably 20 years later <laughs> <laughs> after my experiences, but that's what it was like. You know, every time I entered a new playground, yes. literally and figuratively, I had to reintroduce myself. I had to get people to say my name correctly. Yes. I had to um, find allies and friends immediately. Oh. Oh, I had yeah. to know who the bullies were and stay clear of them or make mm. them my friends. Mm. Um, I had to pick up cultural cues that would not make me a social pariah. Yeah. Perhaps sometimes very different from the place I was just in. You know, because yes. that happens all the time, right? Yep. Innocently, yep. Yep. you say something or do something, and For sure. everybody says, oh, yeah. she's so uncool. And then you're stuck. You <laughs> yeah. know, you're stuck at the table by yourself eating lunch alone. Yeah. You know? And so my, my childhood and in moving around and having to reintroduce myself, I think just set, set me up really well. Hmm. You know, set me up for an understanding of how to both acclimate to new environments without a ton of fear. I can't say that I'm not, yeah. I don't yeah. have fear, um, but help me to get comfortable in my fear of new experiences, new people, um, yes. and also gain the confidence that you can find friends anywhere. You know, all you have to do is be open to it. All yes. you have to do is ask the right questions. All you have to do is make sure that you're interested in them as much yes. as you want them to be interested in you. So that was really the, I think, if anything about the moving around and, <laughs> going into different environments that is what i probably learned most from the time obviously i couldn't articulate it like i can articulate it now yes uh, but but that that is probably the biggest lesson no oh, wonderful uh, in a way it's about really getting outside of your zone of comfort many yeah. times since your very early days and daring yes. daring to connect daring to act daring to engage daring to meet <laughs> Uh, yes, across yes, Africa yes, yes. and the US. That's quite fascinating because given the diversity, yeah. I'm sure the people, kids, families you met with, that must certainly have started to shape your personality and, and yes. the way you've been starting to show up personally. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And you know what, as you're, as you're mentioning that, um, I also think that uh, maybe something I, I haven't actually recognized until just this very moment um, is that I, it gave me the chance to try out new things and mm. fail sometimes yes. at my reintroduction, you yeah. know? Um, and then know that, okay, next time I'm not going to do that thing. <laughs> you know? I'm good. Which, I'm good which, is, which is very, very important and, and yeah. has happened in my career too, right? Where it's like, okay, hey, okay, that didn't yeah. work out here. Let me not do that again at the next place, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so continue, uh, continuing to build on that childhood, uh, Buzz, I'd like to ask, obviously, about your parents. I mean, all the parents, mm. like, remember my, my late dad, wanted me to be a doctor. I understand your, your parents as well, or an engineer, <laughs> but yes. you, de you decided differently. I understand you had some other ideas in mind. You love culture, music. I even yeah. found out that you started as a teacher on music, yeah. uh, specialized uh, on the lyrics of Tupac Shakur which That's I must say uh, 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 I discovered through your, <laughs> through your own teaching. Uh, and mm -hmm. you did that, I think, at the UC Berkeley. So can you share with us, in a way, that moment where you decide to, to kind of take your own path, starting mm. uh, at the core of culture, music, personal yeah. expression of the people? Yeah, well, it's actually a really nice segue because in my childhood, I had to constantly learn about culture, yeah. right? And again, I can articulate it so much better now than I could at nine, Yes. right? <laughs> but um, I was constantly pulling on pop culture to connect with people. Mm. And 
probably the most aggressive of that kind of environment was actually when I was 12 and mm. moved to Colorado Springs, Colorado, directly from Ghana, right? Yeah. And it was that era of having to learn American football because mm. at the time in Colorado Springs or in Colorado, yeah. the Denver Broncos were the kings of football. Yeah. And John Elway was the chieftain. You know, he was the, the high priest of yes. football. And <laughs> it right in the backyard, you know? And yeah. so, and I didn't know about American football. I knew football. Yeah, exactly. Which is the like, other football. Like, like, you know, like me, that, you that's know? That's what I knew. The yes. real football. The yes. real football, yes. The yes. real football. That's what I knew. <laughs> and I was like, what is this thing? You know, why, are they, why are they throwing the ball to each other, you know? And, um, you know, and, and like you said, music or film yeah. or hmm. TV shows, politics even, right? Hmm. Um, yeah. Those were all embedded in my sort of natural survival and then became a real interest. It became like a habit. Hmm. And so by the time I was in college and, yes, following my parents' hopes and dreams <laughs> of becoming a doctor, I was carrying the full course load of pre-med, yeah. um, but I was also taking lots of classes in the arts, hmm. English, a um, lot of history, yeah. uh, literature, you know, and... Um, discovering so much richness mm. in storytelling, especially of the African-American experience that yes. um, I really hadn't been privy to before that. <laughs> and yes, of course, uh, very much in love with Tupac Shakur, <laughs> who died way too early, mm. you know? Um, but I found him to be a poet. Like I said, you know, Jay-Z is yeah. a poet. Tupac is a poet. There's, There's so many poets in, in music. You know, yes. the lyrics are incredible. And so I'd heard about the class huh. at UC Berkeley. I was yes. going to Wesleyan University um, mm -hmm. in Middletown, Connecticut, where incidentally yep. I was also born. Um, and I petitioned my dean <laughs> to make a class like that at well. Wesleyan. And they refused. <laughs> they said, we don't have the time for that. We don't even know what you're talking about. You know, this is not what we teach here. We are a very nice, you know, yeah. like... Little serious. Ivy School. Yes, we're we're serious about <laughs> academics now. You can explore if you want to, because yeah. right? they encouraged hmm. discovery, but they were not about to add it to their own curriculum. Huh. So I took it upon myself to write the curriculum. Oh and wow! Then went back to the dean and petitioned again and said, "Well, now I have the curriculum. Let's do it. All I need is support. <laughs> so yeah. let me teach it." And to my complete awe and shock, wow! <laughs> they allowed me to teach the class. So yeah, I taught it for three semesters. Wonderful. On top of my full course load and everything else, uh, and it was it was brilliant. It was it was wonderful. I think you know again, just um, thinking about what that yeah. experience probably taught me was that uh, you know people can often say no hmm. to you. They can often deny you the thing you want to do because of their own limited experiences. Yeah. But even yeah. if you haven't done it before, the passion, the power that you have within yourself to create should be right. explored and therefore you should always say yes to yourself absolutely dare dare to ask dare to do it all the time <laughs> yes that's right that's right so so after that which was a wonderful moment and maybe later on i come back to teaching who knows maybe this is a vacation for the future but i don't want to turn <laughs> the page yet <laughs> but just teasing you uh so you moved yeah, to new yeah. you moved to new york uh, buzz obviously uh, uh and you right after graduating from college and you got uh, a wonderful start marketing in a very special ad agency uh, led by spike lee <laughs> himself yes. And yes. I know that you, you've been reflecting on that in terms of some of the very first big leadership lessons you had working mm -hmm. with Spike Lee and his team and the way he was making decisions, the way he was making big bets. So how did yeah. you, you know, how did you kind of reflect on that uh, after that wonderful yeah. experience? Well, you know, again, sometimes I look back at my career and experiences and I literally cannot believe how destiny sort of played out along the way you know that everything that was set up in my life that felt accidental was actually part of some master plan that i had no part in creating by the way that's mm. that's the that's the humility i walk around with that um yes of course i have power of course i have an option to do or not to do yeah. but that there is something so much greater than myself mm. which is leading me to places that i could have never dreamed and walking into spike lee's office when I had no experiences, no job, um, <laughs> no real opportunities anywhere in New York yeah. City by myself, you know, yeah. at 23 years old, um, I didn't anticipate 
that the lessons I would learn there would serve me for the would rest be. of my life. Yes. You know, yes. or that he would become a friend. Yeah. And a mentor yes. for the rest of my life. You yes. know, but Spike, Spike is an extraordinary person, mm. not just as an artist, um, but as a philosopher, mm. as a social activist. Yes. As a black person. Yes. You know, he really helped me to understand this complete drive for doing exactly what you want to do, hmm. regardless of your critics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was, he's, he was shocking, you know? Yes. It was shocking to, to be in that kind of intimate space with him hmm. and watch him react to criticism. Hmm. You know, what a lesson, what an incredible hmm. opportunity, you know, hmm. to really be present when you see someone who has poured their heart and soul into their yeah. work hmm. and then somebody else tears it down and how do they react to that? It tells a lot hmm. about a human and about a person. Big time. You know, and I won't say yeah. that he's he's superhuman. It wasn't like he just brushed it off and said, Oh, who cares? You know, yeah. well, screw <laughs> them. He didn't it wasn't like that. He would be very considerate hmm. of the feedback. Hmm. You know, take it in. But at a point where he understood that his art was right. That hmm. was the lesson that I learned from him. Yes. That he knew that regardless of what anybody said about it, they said it was the wrong thing, was the wrong choices, creatively he missed, he knew that his art was right. Hmm. And he stuck by that. Yeah. And that is an, an incredible lesson that I learned because Agreed. I certainly have had my fair share of critics now, JP. Yeah, I've yeah. had <laughs> critics, okay? Indeed. Yes. yes. <laughs> but but I know I'm right. I know I'm right. Like everything that I do, everything, every way that I move. And that doesn't mean that it, it is, that doesn't mean that I'm arrogant not, it, no. not to learn mm -hmm. from things that go wrong, mm. but that my, my expression of self is right yes. all yes. the time. Yeah, I yeah. got you. Wonderful, wonderful lesson to share with our listeners. But I think you also quoted it as saying that one of the most important qualities a, a leader should develop is empathy and mm. the ability to listen really deeply. So how did you learn from other leaders, maybe Spike himself and maybe some others, who has been inspiring you or maybe coaching you along the way? to develop that critical capability, I think that every leader, whatever level the person is, it doesn't matter to me, can yeah. actually embrace, be an yes. incredible listener of uh, talking much less <laughs> and, <laughs> and listening deeply, not superficially, yeah. to what the other yes. person has to tell with our guts, with our mind, our heart, not, not just with the words. How did you learn yes. that? Yeah. You know, I think I learned as much from leaders and people I worked for who did it right hmm. as I as much as I learned it from people who did it wrong. Yeah, of course. You know? um, <laughs> yeah, because that's I think that is the actually the part of leadership that I love most is that you're not born a leader. Hmm. You know, you have some natural qualities, I'm sure, that people are born with. I think that I'm naturally born with. But yeah. I think it's nurture in Completely. the experiences of being led that actually help you to shape who you are as a leader. You know, that's why I don't think it's a singular journey. No. You know, as the inputs come from so many different places that there are the positive and the negatives yes. that then form who you are. And so yeah. sometimes I look at really bad leaders and I'm just like, ooh, you must ooh. have had some really terrible people in your life. I don't you want know, to look like him. Like. You some yeah, it's like, I'm like some people really steered you wrong, you know. Yes. And I think it's it's like it's like hmm. almost like a group project. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. great leaders are not just great leaders because they are. They're great yeah. leaders because they were led very well. Yeah. They were led very very well. Right. And so when I think about you know the experiences of empathy hmm. or of listening, hearing, hmm. you know both of those and all of those experiences are born out of my own personal experience, you know, that yeah. happened to yes. me yeah. in my life, uh, where I didn't feel heard or I didn't feel seen. Hmm. And therefore I want to make sure other people are heard and other people are seen, oh, being seen. as much as it was from, you know, people who really did hear me and see me. Hmm. I think the thing that always scares us as leaders is that um, we think we have to be textbook, you know, <laughs> as if like the yeah, office yeah, yeah, or our yeah, teams yeah. Yes, can yeah. only see what is the professional or the corporate life. Yeah, yeah. But how is that possible? We are human beings with, it, with one experience, you know? It's it like is not. Personal yes. Co yes, it comes into you. the professional. Yes. And so the empathy of understanding why someone behaves the way they do, hmm. 
or why they wouldn't show up in a meeting or why they would be quiet, why they would be afraid to say the thing that's on their mind, yeah. why they would be you know, so dismissive of other people, that is not just about the workspace, that's also about the personal space. What else is going on in their lives that is causing them to exactly. behave this way? Yeah. And so for me, the, the listening is as much about what a person says as as much it is thinking about what it is that might be also causing them to be the, the way that they are and then picking up those clues because people don't often tell you that no you know you no. have to infer and so yes I, I do think it's very important as a leader to know your team so well that you can tell when someone walks in and their energy is off something is different yes you know and either excusing them yeah. you know without saying anything right allowing them to be hmm. um or helping to find a way to encourage them. And sometimes it's a little bit, um, it's, it's a little bit of the like hit and miss, you know, it's yeah, like yeah, yeah. maybe it's like if somebody, you know, it's it, like any relationship, you know, it's like you have somebody on your team, um, they show up a little off that day, they're not on their game, they seem to be missing. Um, and you, you know, or I try to, okay, maybe it's about talking and figuring mm -hmm. out what mm -hmm. else is going on so mm -hmm. that I can help them get that out. And once they get it out, then they can focus on the thing yeah. they're supposed to be doing. <laughs> yeah, 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 um, yeah. Or sometimes it's just like, leave them the hell alone. You know, don't say anything. Pretend like it doesn't exist and just let them be. You know, because some people just need to work it out themselves. And as long as you are that in tune mm -hmm. and care that mm -hmm. much, you'll be a much more effective leader and a much more positive one in that case because Agree. people <laughs> will see your care of yes. them. Yes, No, it's, uh, it's really well said, both in my own experience as a leader as well. I, I learned the lesson in a good and, and tough way sometimes. But what mm. it takes in terms of creating a, a climate of safety, of yes. trust with the people yes. one by one in your team uh, yes. to to enable them to get them to open up and yes. and and it starts i think by being yourself of course truly vulnerable not artificially mm. <laughs> truly authentic mm -hmm. which i know that you are doing a lot and you've been working a lot on that <laughs> yourself as an yes. example yes. <laughs> so that others whatever the level is again doesn't matter can truly mm -hmm. feel safe by speaking up by sharing more than just words, but emotions, personal yeah. big challenges they have in their lives, because we all have just one life, as you said rightly. So That's right. I'm with you, and it's very much aligned with the philosophy I have <laughs> with positive yeah. leadership. So let's continue maybe a little bit, uh, Bozzi. I mean, you left Spikes Agency at one point to manage uh, big brands like PepsiCo, uh, yeah. beverage portfolio, and uh, you, rose, you rose as well to head of music entertainment marketing there. In 2013, mm -hmm. you negotiated a very, very special deal <laughs> between Pepsi and the NFL to run the, the infamous Super Bowl uh, halftime show with Beyonce. And I know it was a huge cultural moment, not just for you. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. for many, many, many people, not just within the, <laughs> within the brands, but outside. So was it for you like a massive personal professional win at the time in terms of realizing wow i can actually do that <laughs> through that strong uh, confidence and expression of the way i think about culture and the way that culture should be brought to the people in such a creative way for the super bowl yes yes well this there are so many places to go with that question. <laughs> it's like you've just you've opened up like Pandora's box, you know, with that one. Um, in the way that you asked the question, because I've talked about that experience so much, but um, yes. you've yes. sparked something else that I am considering right now in this moment, um, which is that you know, uh, I think sometimes in business, you think that your singular experience doesn't matter. Hmm because you're trying to speak to the masses. You know? yep. in, in American sport, there's no bigger stage than, hmm. than the Super Bowl halftime show. There just sure. isn't. It's the yeah. biggest one. It yeah. has the most eyeballs. And like you said, it crosses the borders yes. to some degree. And uh, yeah. other people who may not have an interest in the sport itself care about the performance yes. that's that happening moment. at yeah. the halftime yeah. show. Yeah. 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 And in that moment in 2013, there had been, in my opinion, yeah. not a lot of artists on the stage that were connecting the audience hmm. 
in the time. In, uh, I see, yeah. In yeah. the time. You know, yeah. there were greats, legends, hmm. who had done amazing things, but years passed, sometimes hmm. decades passed, hmm. and they were incredible performers, but safe bets, you know, because they would reach the widest audience. And at the time that we were negotiating the deal with the Super Bowl and mm -hmm. with the NFL, there were, there were options that could have been safe, that could have been, you know, legendary acts yeah. who would have been fine, yeah. you know? Yeah. And by the way, as a business person, who doesn't want to recommend the thing that you know is going to win, the sure of win? Of course. It's a safe, <laughs> it's a sa it's a safe yeah, win. It's a safe, safe bet. Proposition. It's a safe yes. bet. <laughs> like, sometimes, you know, it's like we as leaders, we think, you know what, if I can win at 80%, hmm. let me just do the 80%, because if I try to win at 100 and it goes to 20, yeah. oof, <laughs> that's a big then risk. I've, look, that's, that's a big risk. And so you don't want right. to take it. And I understand yeah. why most people do that. And yeah. guess what? There are a lot of people who are in the Hall of Fame who hit 80% consistently. Yeah, I'm not yeah. mad at them. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. my life is not set up that way. <laughs> <laughs> I prefer to swing for the fences. You know, I prefer uh -huh. <laughs> to try to get to the hundred. And if I get to twenty, you know what? I will crawl into a cave and hide out for a little while until <laughs> I lick you... my wounds and make sure that I'm okay, and then come back out. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I'll come with sunglasses and maybe yeah. like a wig on and make sure nobody can see me. But I'm gonna come back outside. You know. I love um, it. But that moment. But that moment. Yeah with Beyonce, hmm. it was such a fight. It was hmm. a real fight to get her yeah. on the stage because she's a black woman. There hadn't been another a black woman on the stage since Janet Jackson and right. her wardrobe malfunction with Justin Timberlake. I always yeah. like to mention his name too because people want to always say Janet. Hmm. And I'm like, no, Justin's yeah. the one that pulled it. But in yes. any case, um, <laughs> there hadn't been a black woman on that stage hmm. and there was all kinds of what I felt were biases that mm. were outside of the regular yeah. biases that we all know yes. <laughs> that go against people <laughs> yeah. of color and women, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And those biases extended to wardrobe mm. and the performance and mm. could she connect with the large audience that way and mm. all kinds of things. That it was just, of course, now sitting here, you know, almost a decade later, decade that, everyone yeah. would say, oh, that's ridiculous. Why that's wouldn't obvious. you want Beyonce? Of <laughs> you know what I mean? But at the time, it was a, it was. It was a real conversation. Yeah. And the reason why I bring it back to our singular experiences being important is that I knew it. Hmm. I felt it. I loved Beyonce, loved and love still, yeah. <laughs> you know? And I, I felt personally responsible Yes, as a black woman, hmm. but also personally responsible to make to. sure that in my seat, I uplifted people, performances, culture that yeah. is important to me. You know, and that I think sometimes is missing <laughs> in our leadership. You yes. know, we think that it's better, like again, to hit the 80, 80 which but, is the masses yeah. and safe, yeah. rather than to go for the 100, which could fail. And look, we were in danger. It could have yes. failed. It could have failed miserably. It could have been awful. But instead, I don't even think we hit 100. We hit like 150. That yeah. joint was pff, in <laughs> was the huge. stratosphere, gone, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. And the thing well, is that the other lesson in that is that our experiences, hmm. even if unique and singular, can still connect. Yeah. People can still empathize. People can still enjoy. People hmm. can still feel excitement, even if they are not close to the experience that you're talking about. And yeah. that was the proof in Beyonce's per performance of the Super Bowl. No, I think what, what a wonderful uh, reflection, I think, uh, Buzz. I mean, I heard you talk about that story many times. But I think the angle you, you get in your response, I love it. I love the 80, yeah. and I love the 150 <laughs> as well, <laughs> better. <laughs> no, exactly. and I love the fact, I mean, the way you talk about it, it's about the way you've been, not just speaking up, you've been really elevating, actually, something bigger mm -hmm. than yourself. Through, of yeah. course, uh, someone who's, who has become afterwards an icon globally <laughs> yes, yes. of something yes. that was critical culturally for, mm -hmm. I think, for, for the masses, for everyone, for all the mm -hmm. people. And mm -hmm. that, that took some courage, for sure, a lot of courage <laughs> to push that ID through. So <laughs> congrats on that. <laughs> you Thank know, actually, you. I, I recently had a podcast which will be on the air soon with someone called Bill George. Bill George used to be the CEO of uh, Medtronic, healthcare company. Mm. And he also published a book called uh, Find uh, Your, uh, Discover Your True North. And he's got oh. this concept that he calls a crucible. And a crucible 
the way he, he talks about it is one of the very few defining moments in your life. One of those defining moments where something deep is happening into yourself that is really changing in a way, I'm not saying your DNA, but <laughs> the substance yeah. of who you're going to be in the future. Yeah. And, uh, and I wanted to say, to me, it sounds like that particular moment Mm. could be maybe but of course you, you'll be the own judge to <laughs> decide that maybe in yeah. your book could be one of your crucibles of yeah. defining who Bose was is going to be all about <laughs> yeah yeah no that is so interesting I love that that concept that crucible concept um, I think I've had a lot of crucibles Actually. A lot. So we'll let's explore, yeah. let's explore a few more, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think there yeah. have been there have been quite a few. Um, yeah. And if I if I consider yeah the time, hmm. you know, the 2013 yes. as a crucible year. Let's put yes. it that way. Yes. You know, with many things that happen and two that big year. ones. One at the start and one at the end. So hmm. that the start was Beyonce yes. and the Super Bowl. At the end, in December, on December 11, 2013, is when my husband passed away from yes. cancer. Yes. Um, and that crucible moment hmm. absolutely changed my life. Yes. It changed everything about the way that I am, hmm. the way that I think, um, the way that I live. Hmm. It changed everything. You know, I think um, we have, there's a quote somewhere, I'm not quite sure who said it, but it's about you know, how our experiences shape us, not yeah. because of the things that happen to us, but because of the way that we react to right. the things. Absolutely. You know, and um, it's a choice. It is a choice. And at the time, my daughter was four. Hmm. Um, I just had a very powerful year, as, as we've just talked about. I was at yeah. the, some highs in my life, in hmm. career-wise anyway. Um, but at the same time, my husband was battling cancer and I, hmm and we weren't sure what was going to happen. Um, and in the end, when he was told that his cancer was gonna be terminal hmm. and that he didn't have much longer, the list of things that we created to do together, yeah. Yeah. I guess you could call it a bucket list of sorts, but yeah. um, they, weren't, they weren't the things that I think, some people think, you know, it's like, oh, go jump out of a plane. <laughs> and you know, it's like travel yeah. to Malaysia and backpack. You know, it wasn't yes. that. Well, no. first of all, he wasn't healthy enough to do that. Of but mm. also, we went. It wasn't that. It was. It, they were smaller, but much more significant. Mm. You know, they were the conversations that we had avoided. Mm. Yeah, you know? mm. it was the small experience that you knew would be the last one. Yes, that savoring of life. Yes really understanding that um, moments really do matter. We say it all the time, <laughs> right? We that, don't. that it's like, we, yeah. we should live life like as if it's your last. We say that kind of stuff all the time. And maybe people think that's morbid. I actually think it's very inspiring. It is. You know, his, his, his death inspired me. It inspired me. Now, I wish he hadn't have died. Hmm. With every cell in my being, hmm. uh, it still brings me to tears, even as I sit here. Yeah. But his death won't go un... <sighs> he wouldn't have died for nothing. Hmm. You know, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. That yeah. he died and I am going to take inspiration from it. You know, I'm going to live a bigger life because of it. I'm going to live a more expressive life because of it. I'm going to yes. live a more urgent life. Urgent life, it. yes. Urgent uh, life, urgent. you know? It is, it is what I now am so grateful and thankful for, you know? Yes. I, I, I do believe in an afterlife, and I can't wait until one day when I see him again, I'm just like, well, thank you so much for the gift. <laughs> thank you so much for the gift yes. of allowing me to live such a great life yeah. because you died, you know? I honestly, JP, as I sit here, I don't know. I mean, I guess we'll never know if I would have been as expansive hmm. in my career and in my life had I not have had the, this experience. This experience, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I can feel it. I mean, I can feel it in, 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 in your voice. I can feel it mm -hmm. as well clearly, you know, in the way you, you talk about it. And I think it's, uh, 
I mean, uh, I must say myself, uh, to go through one of those crucibles, uh, losing my son a few years ago. And, um, mm -hmm. and in a way, what you, I mean, the way you share your story with your husband resonated deeply <laughs> with me, obviously, both, because yeah. I, I've definitely considered life very differently the day after. Mm. And that, that, that sense of urgency, that sense of, uh, contribution yeah. as well to do yes. more as well not just for me but for others and maybe in a modest way for the world whatever it means for for mm. for me and others is mm -hmm. something I, I can relate to so I, 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 I like you maybe to elaborate a little bit more on that urgency in the way you you've been doing it since then I know you've been living incredibly intensely with your husband for six months before yeah. he passed yeah. away and as you said, as you said, interesting enough, which I love as well, it's not about those big spectacular things that, you know, <laughs> that you see in the movie yeah. with Jack Nicholson, right. actually. <laughs> That's Beckett. I recall right, the movie. Exactly. <laughs> but it's, right. it's, about, it, it's about those very small things, those very small, very deep, personal, intimate things with the people you love the most, I think. <laughs> yeah. And so yeah. could you share with us in a way that has been shaping you beyond the six months? Because for the last decade and more to come. Mm -hmm. The depths of that urgency, the vibrancy of that urgency, what it means when you wake up in the morning <laughs> or yes. when you go to bed and you reflect on your day or not saying, well, did I actually, did I, did I actually respected my urgency contract with myself, if I may use mm. that expression. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. But you know, the word that you use that I love so much is vibrancy. What a great word, you know, to describe what urgency actually means. You know, that um, there is so much excitement <laughs> yeah. that, that we're privy to, you know, that we have, we, ha we can choose. I have a very hard time now I'll, hmm. I'll start from now and then go a little bit ba backwards right I have a very hard time now with situations people relationships experiences that are not satisfying to me yeah you know and I think it's it's actually it's so funny because I think maybe some people would consider it a selfish way to live you know to think about yourself <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think so, you know. And it's not—it's not at the cost of other people. That's not what I'm saying. But it's a self-awareness yes. is really what I mean, yeah. you know. In that way, where you are focused on what is making you happy, and yes. happiness is not a throwaway word, you know. Mm. I don't mean the like sugar high type of happiness that dissipates after a few hours and you're like oh what's next you know but yeah. the things that like really make you happy make you open your eyes in the morning and say oh well thank god for another day you know you, and i'm not you, saying yeah. that every experience is like no, you know every single yeah. day you wake up and bound out of bed that's not it there are still yes. valleys yeah. but my point is that my urgency and the vibrancy with which i'm living my life forces me to constantly evaluate whether or not I am enjoying the thing that I'm in. Yes. And if I'm not, I have very little patience to remain. I'm with you. I'm with you. And because yeah. I think you have this sense of scarcity of uh, being joyful and living yes. some very unique moments with real people who, mm -hmm. who matter and people <laughs> with whom you can actually... Uh, you know, you cannot just have a good relationship with, but you can actually achieve more together. At least that's the way I can think about it, <laughs> and then yeah. and the way yeah. it connects with me. And building on that, maybe both. You know, um, in a way, you know, I was thinking about living your life urgently, which I know is something you are working on actively on a book. <laughs> so yes, you can talk about I that. <laughs> to me, it kind of also means maybe not waiting anymore to realize your full potential. Uh, for yes. each one of us. So helping mm -hmm. you becoming what we call the best version of yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and, and usually when you can unlock your greatness, 
is when you work on the harder things as well. <laughs> yes. And I was having a discussion actually with one of my guests in the podcast, uh, someone you may know or not, he's called, his name is Michael Bungestani. He's a best-seller oh. author of uh, the best-selling book ever on coaching. It's called The Coaching Habits. Wonderful. He's been my coach myself. I've been using him across on Microsoft to transform uh, thousands right. of people. And, and I was discussing with Michael, actually, one of his last books, which is which is really um, all about, it's called How to Begin. Mm -hmm. how, how can you actually really shape your, what he's calling your worthy goals, your worthy goals. Mm -hmm. So basically the projects that are really thrilling, deeply important and daunting. <laughs> and, uh, but of course, defining them is one thing but achieving them is much harder. <laughs> and yes, so just to yes. finish on that, uh, Michael has been writing this interesting book on the way you do that, on the worthy goals, and the way you start getting committed to achieving those worthy goals. It's a mm. practical guide. So my question to you is, is, is more about, you are really, I think, on one of those worthy goals, because I, I think it's super hard to write a book, by the way. So first of all, <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you that one saying, wow, that's a huge one. And I look forward to read yeah. your, your book, both when it's, when, it's, when, it's, when it's published. But what are, if you may share, what are the other big, big worthy goals that, in, that you are working on, maybe, that you are thinking about? And they are, might not be out yet, but the big mm -hmm. things that you have on your mind. Gosh, well, there's so, there's so <laughs> much that goes into writing a book, as you know. Um, and as you've said, it's not an easy thing. It's not the type of thing that, um, you know, you go into, I think, even knowing what it's going to do <laughs> or yeah. how you're going to react. You know, the fact that there is so much that sometimes can be unearthed out of the experience of writing yeah. that if you if you knew you probably wouldn't do it <laughs> is that okay to say you know you if did. you knew if you knew what it would take you probably would actually you know what let me not make it about other people let me make it about myself you know <laughs> if i knew what it would take i don't know that i would have done it you know it's it. so <laughs> difficult oh, difficult yeah and i don't i don't you know much like grief i don't like to compare you yes. know because i'm like look grief is grief um somebody's hardship is you can't compare it to somebody else's you yes. know yeah. it's like writing a memoir and writing a self-help book and writing a you know book of poetry are all very different experiences i'm not going to say one is harder than another yeah. but the only thing i've written is a memoir and i know oh, that okay. joint is hard okay, <laughs> okay. it is yeah. very difficult it is and hard. the yeah. the idea of really going deep into your experience yeah. and sharing it yeah. being vulnerable with it Yes. is much scarier than I thought. Hmm. It's interesting. I was having this conversation with one of my mentors, Ariana Huffington, hmm. um, a few weeks ago. Yeah. I, um, I had just, or actually a few months ago, I had just turned in the final copy edited, yeah. you know, version of the book. And <laughs> I called her in terror. Because <laughs> you know? I was like, oh my God, what have I done? Why did I do it? Why did you tell me not to do it? You know, <laughs> blaming everyone else. Yeah. And she said, you know, she's like, just consider that the truth is a privilege. Yes. It's a real privilege. She's like, not everybody is entitled to your truth. Hmm. She's like, I don't know why people think that everybody is entitled to truth. Yes. Like, it's a privilege. It and is. she's like, and you can decide whether or not you think these strangers, these people who don't know you, hmm. who will pick up your words and interpret it for themselves, are they worthy of your truth? <sighs> Yeah. Oof. <laughs> Can I? Do, that knocked me on my butt. I sat down and I said, "Oh my god, I had never, I had never considered that." You know, the yes. truth is a privilege, and for me, I think part of my now confidence mm. in being able, and maybe confidence is too strong of a word because I'm, no. I still have my days where I'm unsure. Of course, um, we all do. <laughs> but maybe more my comfortability. Let's put it that yeah. way. My comfortability yeah. with being able to share this very vulnerable expression is that um, I do think I do think my truth is valuable hmm. and I believe that expressing it is a gift to myself and not so much about yeah. 
other people and what they need from me. Yes. You know, but that the privilege of sharing my truth is one that I value very much hmm. and one that I am proud of. And so regardless of how people will react to it or how they'll interpret it is actually not my burden. You know, I hope that people <laughs> see it in a way that will help them to live their own urgent lives. I really hope that that's what happens. Yes. yes. You know, that people will read it and say, ah, but I can too. You know, I can do the I can, same. I can, I can, yes, I can, I can do I can. it. That yeah. regardless of the things that have happened to me, yeah. that I can choose to live a life that is worthy of living. It's worthy of the breath. It is worthy of the excitement. It is worthy of me. Yes. You know, that you won't just skate through the experiences. You won't just count down the days and say, okay, well, fine. Ooh, thank God we're at the end of another year. Now what's this next year got to have? You know, it's like, no. You know, yeah. you got to feel like, oh, I want to do the next big thing. I want to hmm. do the thing that's going to make me sit down and tell my grandchildren one day. You know? Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm very much looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to 80-year-old Bose. I really am. <laughs> I'm, I'm excited for her. You know, I'm excited for the story she's going to tell. I'm excited for the <laughs> zero F's she's going to give. <laughs> I'm excited about how she'll tell her grandchildren like stories that are probably very inappropriate. I'm excited. You're excited about that. <laughs> That's fantastic. We are coming almost to an end, Buzz. I want to obviously uh, make sure we, oh. we, we stay on the time. But a couple of last questions, yeah. if I may. You know, I know you've been speaking, um, you know, in the past about how very different people throughout your career have wanted to change you. They wanted to change you, literally. <laughs> mm -hmm. wanted you mm -hmm. to turn down your look, your voice, basically to take up less space, right? To be Ooh. absent. Yes. To, um, and I think it's a big question, obviously, these days, even more so. I mean, it's been always a huge question, I think, which is the question of conformity and the mm -hmm. question of real uh, difference and diversity in, in, a, in, a, in a richest possible way, which is you know, how would you, so let me, let, me shape, let, let me define a question. Given the experience you've gone through in a very early age, we talk about your very early stars in you know, Colorado, Ghana, yeah. Kenya, many different places where you showed up and people probably didn't, didn't, didn't expect you to show up the way you showed up. And, <laughs> and yeah. so in a way you, you become, I think you are one of those role models for people. Uh, a number of very different people, by the way, uh, of course, African-Americans, but many others as well, on not necessarily accepting conformity, <laughs> but bringing the very best of who you are. So what would be your coaching advice for all the listeners on this podcast who are coming from all kind of paths in life, right? Because, it, I mean, all, all of people kind of so different stories, gender, ethnics, you know, huge uh, drama in their lives mm -hmm. where uh, they have a hard time to conform and they are suffering mm -hmm. every day. What is your <laughs> coaching moment with all those people listening to you, not just on what you did, but the best way to, to do that and, and to yes. evolve and, and not conform, not accept to conform anymore? Wow. <laughs> it's a big one. <laughs> it's, it's, it's enormous. <laughs> it's a big, 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 big one. Maybe that'll be my next book, you know? Um, well, no, I don't want to write another book, right? Because I just said how difficult it was. <laughs> Let me not commit that now. Exactly. Well, it must be a chap maybe, a chapter, maybe a chapter of your book. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, maybe, maybe it makes it into a chapter. Um, no, it's such a big question because I, I think it is, um, it is not an easy one. No. You know, um, conformity is so easy. Hmm. And it is what our natural human instinct is. And so we're actually fighting our nature when we don't conform. You know, well, like we're, yeah, we're tribal. We're tribal. Yes. We've always been as human yeah. beings, right? Yeah. We yeah. come together in groups. Um, of course, back in the day, yeah. by you know, Communities. proximity. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, now more so about interest yes. or ways that, you know, maybe it's work related or it's sports or it's music or something else. Right. Yeah, that yeah. makes you stick yeah. to tribes. And so conforming to those identities yes. is natural. Yeah. You know, what I want us to consider 
when we think about nonconformity, is not so much living in the uncomfortable hmm. or going against our nature. You know, yeah. that's not the opposite thing, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you think conformity, you're like, oh, then you must not conform, which means I must live in the uncomfortable. No, you don't need to do that. Yep. I actually want you to get even deeper in your comfort. Hmm. Get deeper. You think you're comfortable now. I promise you, you are not. Hmm. The deeper you go, it's like burrowing into the center of the earth. Yep. <laughs> getting even more into your comfort zone as your individual self is actually what makes you unconform. Yes. You know, you get oh. into a place where you truly value hmm. yourself. You are excited about yourself. You yes. think that your history, your experiences, your ideas, your thoughts, your values are important contributions to the world, yeah. to your society, to your neighborhood, yes. <laughs> to your family, <laughs> yes, <laughs> and then even to yourself. Yeah. You know? And getting even more comfortable is actually hmm. what breaks you out of the conformity. Because there is no way that you, you know, can love all those things about yourself, value all those things about yourself, and then conform to something that doesn't fit. It's impossible. It and is. so what you see yep. is not a challenge. Like when people look at me and they say, ah, well, she doesn't conform. She's a disruptor. You yep. know, she does things her way if she doesn't care about the thing yeah. no 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 no, yeah. no it's not that it's not that actually what you're looking at is someone who is entirely comfortable with herself very yes. comfortable yeah. there aren't parts of me even the stuff that is not great <laughs> that i don't love yeah. <laughs> you yes. know even that stuff i love yes. i'm like oh you know what i could be a little bit of an asshole but i like it anyway you know yeah <laughs> No, I, I, I love the way, again, you, you, you express that, Boz. I mean, maybe to finish with my very last question. In a way, it, it remind me, actually, on, uh, on a podcast, again, guest I had. is one of, um, mm -hmm. you know, the godfathers of positive psychology. His name is Kim Cameron. And mm -hmm. he, he, he's been writing a few great books. And what, what he did with me during the podcast was interesting. was an exercise. It's, it's called uh, The Best Self-Portrait. And what he did... Mm -hmm. He sent an email uh, without copying me. He just asked me names of people I knew really well, personally, family, deep friends, professional, social life, seven. Mm -hmm. And he asked mm -hmm. them to write down 10, 12 lines on the best stories of JP in his life. They've seen the best ah. of me. And then, uh -huh. and then he's been reading that to me anonymously. I was, didn't know who was said, although, of course, oh the stories God. would tell me, oh, yeah, I think I know <laughs> who's that. Right. But this work, which is at the core of that positive leash and positivity, gives you so much positive energy, gives you so much mm -hmm. more confidence in your strengths, mm -hmm. in your talents, mm -hmm. in your passion, <laughs> what you do the mm -hmm. best and where you can bring the best to, the, to others and to the world. And so I'd like to finish that, unfortunately, too short of a time together on the podcast yes. with a question about your own way to generate positivity not just within yeah. yourself because i think you start with yourself first every morning yeah. every day and sometimes we have very bad days horrible yes. days <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Uh, and and yet how do you come up not just with a nice smile and beautiful colors but with positivity that is contagious with others mm -hmm. that drive mm -hmm. others to do more in mm. their jobs, in their lives, in their initiatives. So that would be my last question as a positive leader. And I can <laughs> even envision you as a teacher, as a teacher of positive leadership. Yes. What, would be, <laughs> what, would, what would be that way for you to generate, manage, and drive the positivity, uh, mm. Bose? Mm. Well, I think it's very, actually pretty simple, you know, which is that um, it's like a baby. Hmm. You know, if you've ever interacted with, uh, let's say, a six-month-old, you know, yeah. old enough to recognize yeah. what you're doing with your face, yeah. if you smile at yeah. a baby, more than likely they smile back at you. They do. Retail. If you make a mean face, yeah. they get a little scared and they get a little yeah. worried. Their face <laughs> changes, you know? Yeah. If you cry, hmm. they get confused, you know? They're looking at you like, what is yeah. wrong? They can't articulate yes. those things, but the yeah. facial expression, the way that you express yourself, yeah. has great impact. I think, we think, that that changes over time. 
It doesn't. Yeah. It continues. Yes. You know? And so when I walk into a room, and I think if there were people who were talking about stories about me, hmm. you know, or giving me that kind of self-portrait, yeah. they would say that when I am very excited about something, or I'm happy about something, or I'm frustrated about something, yeah. or I'm angry about something, everyone can feel it. Uh -huh. <laughs> I don't play the poker face. I don't do that. I think it's a disservice. Yeah. Yeah. It's a disservice to our teams. Yeah. It's a disservice to our relationships to pretend as if everything is okay when the sky is falling. When it's not okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Or to play it safe and quiet when you're super enthused. Yeah. By the way, even about your own ideas. Yes. Now, maybe your ideas are terrible, but <laughs> <laughs> having enthusiasm about yes. it allows for other people to also show up with enthusiasm. You know, so it is like smiling and enjoying the experience yep. you're having, which allows other people to give it back to you. Hmm. And so I don't know that it's necessarily just about, hmm. um, you know, me exuding my excitement yep. versus that I am trying to elicit a reaction Ways. from people, yeah. which is compatible with how I'm feeling. And if it is not compatible, then that changes. I am hmm. as much a receptor as I am an exhibitor. Yeah. You know? And yeah. so if yeah. I mm. walk in and you're downtrodden yeah. and you feel <clears throat> depressed or you feel angry, <clears throat> I'm also going to take that. And so that's why I am very consciously empathetic yes. about what is happening in the environment so hmm. it can help to change the environment and make yeah. us all better in that way. Hmm. Fantastic. And in a way, I'm going to capture what you said and I'm going to do a shortcut, of course. And it's like, you know, it's like really uh, being that baby again, right? Yes, <laughs> being exactly. that baby again that you're talking about who is yes. literally reacting with her emotions, with her sense of what's going on with that, with my mom, with that as a person in front of me and having that deep, 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 visceral connection uh, right. uh, as a baby, maybe. I don't know. That's, uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's yes, but, because it's, the, the, but it's something to explore, JP, right? <laughs> I mean, I don't know that we talk enough about that. You know, I think we should. Maybe maybe you should do another podcast about maybe that. As you a, know, the, yes, yes, the, the behaviors that we keep from yeah, infancy. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, so with that, Buzz, I wanted first of all, of course, to deeply, deeply thank you. It's been really a delight to have this conversation with My you. Pleasure, yes. Get to know you a little bit better because I certainly don't pretend to know you well. Although you are showing, I think, a lot about yourself in every conversation. That's, I think, real. I can feel it despite the video conferencing. <laughs> and if you're in the same room, I'm sure I could feel even more. And so yeah. it's been really uh, fantastic to, to have your voice, not just your voice, your emotions, your, your lessons being learned and shared with our listeners. Thank you so much on the bottom of my heart, uh, Buzz. And hopefully one day maybe our, our paths will cross in the US or yes, somewhere in the world. Yes. If you come to Paris, you're welcome. More than, yes. more than happy to have you for a cup of coffee oh. or, or lunch. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, JP. This has been truly a pleasure. And I, I'm very, very appreciative of the mission and also the conversation. So thank you. And all the very best for your book, of course. <laughs> thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> thank you. It's a big deal. <laughs>